chose the chef. And you can't go from Regal Park to here because you're going over the highway. The Arabs can't go over highways. They can't go over a street that's more than 16 alms, 32 feet wide. You know, so we don't have Eruvin that go over the Grand Central, they don't go over the... Okay, let's go... Well, you know they did another thing, they blocked people from coming 57 feet over here. Right. They put up that gate there. People coming from 57 feet to the shoe over here, they blocked it there, and no one can go. Why? They only go through one gate. They put the gates. For one side you can get in, but you cannot go for the out from the outer side. You have to get in, out from the same door. It's two doors, the different keys. Where? Electronic. Here or? Yeah, here, here. Left, left right. Left right. In the middle, the pool, pool side. They're doing a renovation because it's a little bit big chaos right now. What's going, what goes on? It, it happens. Is it doing it because of security? Yes. Security. They said because of security. Yes. yes. There's a lot of crime happening. A lot of guys got beaten, but they don't beaten, want beaten people, on Halloween actually. Yeah. They don't want Jewish people guys got beaten on Halloween. True, like. And they run away from those places. It's like a sort of a sort of a. Uh, uh, how you say this? Shortcut for the for the clients yes, the to run away. Sure. And a lot of cops got killed because of that. So they noticed that they have a they have cameras over here, all over. Right. They must have cameras because, as I know, as I have lived here over 20 years, maybe every two years, it, you hear like cops got shot, basically. Night yeah. night. Last shot was like three or four months ago. Yeah. it's very dangerous. A lot of drugs dealing, a lot of drugs dealing. You don't hear that, but you hear them all yes. the time, shootings and knifings. In here too. It happened, lady, pregnant lady got uh, uh, killed and yeah. she got shot. She In was the supposed hallway, to, she was supposed to witness floor. the criminal court. And she got shot right, right by her uh, uh, building. Inside, no, of the inside of the building, on the floor, on her floor, next to the, her door. Right. And her right. husband heard it and called the police, but didn't come out. He didn't, he didn't right. know that Six she months killed. ago. Happened in this building. Yeah, in, in this, this building, building, yeah. Yeah, this building. One she was pregnant and five kids. Five kids. She, she was died. a witness. She, died. she was a witness, witness to the crime. Okay, let's begin. I want to go a little bit more of what we talked about last week, but I want to go into Vos Hanan as well. You taping? Yeah. Okay. Vos Hanan el Hashem o Esa Hilema. Moshe Rabbeinu says, when it got to the point that we were about to go into Israel, I daven one more time to Hashem. Actually, the Gemara says that he davened 515 tefillot, which is not so difficult, because in the course of an average year, how many tefillot do you daven? Over a thousand. If you figure, shacharit mincha mari, three times a day. So in a week, you daven 21 tefillot. Mm -hmm. And actually it's 22, because on Shabbat you have Musaf as well. Okay? So you have 22. So in a month, you have 88. So yeah. you know, in a year, you have over a thousand times you daven to Hashem. Between all the Chagim, Pesach, Sukkot, you know, over a thousand times. So Moshe daven, 515 Tzvilot, it, it calculated from when Aharon died. And he realized, whoa, this is serious. Aharon died means I'm next. So he started to daven. Let me go into Eretz Yisrael. Let me go into Israel. We're going to talk about this a little bit more in a moment. Uh, in Parshas Baz Hanon, Moshe separates three cities, the Ore Miklat. If a person kills by accident, he runs to one of those three cities. The, the, the Gemara says that the three cities he separated don't go into effect until the three cities in Israel are separated. So he made three cities on this side of the Jordan, but they weren't effective, they didn't work until Yeshua made the three cities in Israel. So they asked the question, so why did he make those three cities? If they weren't going to work, the answer was, it was a mitzvah. Moshe wanted to do whatever he could. He started, I made these three cities. Those cities, if I can make them, I'll make them. If not, not my problem, but at least I started. At least I started. That's how much Moshe Rabbeinu loved doing mitzvahs. Whatever he could do, he did. Now, there's a very interesting thing over here from Rabbeinu Yonah. I don't know if you've ever heard of Rabbeinu Yonah. Rabbeinu Yonah lived in 1233. 
the 12th century. And he wrote a Musr book, and the Musr is the Shari Teshuva of Rabbeinu Yoda. Okay? It's a safer. It's a book. Calls it a lot of times. Many times. The, the Shari Tshuva of Rabbeinu Yonah is one of the most famous, well-known, learned books on Tshuva, how to do Tshuva. And complicated too from the Poskim. Very complicated. What people don't realize is the reason he wrote it. Why did he write it? The short answer is because people learn, need to learn Musa. People need to learn how to be a better person. Musa is ethical. Teaches you midot, how to be a good person. But most people don't know the reason why he wrote it. When I tell you the reason, you may not like it. Should I tell you the reason? So I have over here it was an article that the reason he wrote it, I'll tell you in a moment. It says that in the year 1233, which is 800 years ago, a little bit less than 800 years ago, Rabbi Yona was one of the leading rabbis in Europe. And he put a cheiru, a gzeira, cheiru, against the Rambam. Rabbi Yona? Rabbi Yona. Wow. And the reason is, he didn't like the Rambam's book, Mora Nebuchim. The Mora Nebuchim was a philosophy book. And he felt people would learn the wrong message, learn the wrong thing. One day, because people were pushing him, make a stand, do something that gets attention, he took the Rambam's book, Mora Nebuchim, and he took the first volume of the Rambam's book, Yad Chazaka, and in public, in one of the public squares, he burnt both books to show that not only can you not have these books, you shouldn't even have it in your library, he burnt those books. Eight year, uh, that was 1233, 1242, which is eight years later, in the exact same spot, the Christians in his community burnt 24 wagons full of books. Gemara's, Mishnah's, Chumashim. He burned two books. Thousands of books were burnt eight years later by the Christians. He understood that if the same place, why is that coincidence? Of all the places in the world, they burn thousands of Hebrew books. In the same place I burnt the Rambam's book could only be one reason. I made a mistake, and Hashem is punishing me. So, after that, for the rest of his life, he learned the Rambam, he supported the Rambam, he went all over Europe telling people to buy the Rambam's books. Mm -hmm. And he still felt so bad that he wrote the Shari Tshuva as a blueprint for doing Tshuva, for repentance, because he had to ask the Rambam forgiveness for burning his books. That's a pretty crazy story. Because the Shari Chuba is a very harsh, a very important book. And he, he, he learned from this that, you know, things don't happen for no reason. And therefore, if it happened, there's a lesson to be learned. And the lesson he learned was he made a mistake. He was too quick to judge the Ramba. So it, it was unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, Rabbi Lef, Rabbi Zev Lef, who is in Kiryat Matis Yahu in Israel, he says that we just had on Friday two Ba'av, the 15th day of Av. The Moore says there was no happier day in the calendar like the 15th day of Av and Motsay Yom Kippur. So the day after Yom Kippur, I understand. You just davened the whole day, you fasted the whole day, and you feel like Hashem just took away all your Avedo, so of course you're happy. What's so special about the 15th day of Av? So we know a lot of good things happen on that day, the 15th day of Av. 
those who died in Beitar were buried, and it's a good day to get married, she duchamized. He says the, the joy of the 15th day of Av is because it's a day that the Chachamim made the bracha HaTov V'HaMetiv. It's a bracha we make whenever we get good news. What's the bracha we make when we get bad news? Dayan, Dayan HaEmet. You know, it says that if a person's father dies, God forbid, and they have to make that bracha, then they find out that the brother left, father left them a million dollars. So they make the bracha Dayan HaEmet, then they have to make the bracha HaTov HaMetiv because they got good news. They just, earned, they just got an inheritance in Yerusha of a million dollars. That day they made that bracha. And where do they put it? In the Birkat HaMazot. Who made it, who hated who hated it, who hated it, who made that bracha in the, in the Birkat HaMazot. He says, what was so special about that day? Because good news means a person has hakadat HaTov. They feel good. They recognize good. When you recognize good, that's, that's a good thing. When a person does good and you realize it, it's worth making a bracha. So for that it was very, very much, very, very, very special. Okay, I want to continue a little bit what we spoke about last week on, on the Chuba Meit HaMikdash. And I want to go on a different theme, and next year I'm going to go through it again, but I want to go a little bit now so you should have some idea. Listen to this question. The Gemara says, the Gemara says that they asked, people asked, Alma Chorva why was the land destroyed? Why was the Beit HaMikdash destroyed? People ask that question. Then the Gemara says, They went over to the Navi, the prophet, and they said, tell us the reason. Why? Why, did, why was the Beit HaMikdash destroyed? And the Navi told them, because they weren't very careful in making Birkat HaTorah. In the morning, in Shacharit, when you get up in the morning, you make Brachot, Modeani, the first bracha you make is on tzitzit. Then you make a bracha on your talit at some point. Then you make a bracha on the tilat yadai. Then you make a bracha about going to the bathroom. Then you make a bracha la asok b'divrei Torah, right? To learn Torah. People didn't make that bracha. Somehow they got lazy. They didn't make that bracha. And for that, the Beit Hamidus was destroyed. That's what the Gemara says. So they ask, which Beit HaMikdash are they talking about? If they ask the Nevi'im, it could only be the first Beit HaMikdash. Because in the second Beit HaMikdash, there were no more Nevi'im. So it had to be the first Beit HaMikdash. First Beit HaMikdash, we know why it was destroyed. People committed murder. People committed idolatry, idol, avodah zarah. People were not moral. They were not ethical. There's no, there's no mystery. The second Beit HaMikdash, they were much better. Sinat chinam. The, the people didn't like each other. But the first Beit HaMikdash, we know why. So what are you telling me because they didn't make a bracha on the Torah? What does that have to do with murder? So the answer was as follows. This was the question. They, they understood why the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. But this was their question. Listen to the question. How is it possible that a guy sits and learns Torah all day in Yeshiva and on his way home, he gets a fight with his friend, and he kills his friend. Mm. That's their question. That means, in the first Beit HaMikdash, you know, Chizkiyahu HaMelech, he put a knife, you know, a sword outside the school. The Beit HaMikdash, he says, whoever doesn't know the Torah, I'm going to cut him up with a knife. Everybody got a hundred on that test. <laughs> <laughs> on that test, on that it's year, afraid. nobody failed. Everybody got an A+. Plus. So they learned Torah. They knew Torah. So he says, I don't get it. How is it possible a person learns Torah and they go murder at night? They learn Torah and then they go worship idols. They learn Torah and they're not honest people in their families. How is it possible? That was the question. So one of the answers that they give is a very interesting answer. David HaMelech, he was 70 years old. Towards the end of his life, he had a sickness. What was his sickness? Do you remember? Oh, he had chills. 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 He was cold. 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 So they covered the him with blankets. Yeah. Did the blankets keep him warm? Yeah. Didn't work. Why not? Normally, blankets keep you warm. Yeah. So why did the blankets work? 
So the Gemara says that years earlier, when Shaul HaMelech was sleeping, David wanted to show him, I could kill you, but I didn't, so I'm not your enemy. How did he do that? He snuck in the camp and he cut his coat. He took his corner of his coat and he cut it. He ripped it. So the Gemara says, if you don't respect clothes, when you're older and you need the clothes to warm and respect you, they won't do it. Uh, <laughs> it's that time his blanket is not held. You didn't respect the king's clothes. So now when you're older, the clothes don't respect you. So they say, if a person doesn't respect the Torah, they could learn Torah day and night, but if you don't respect the Torah, the Torah can't protect you. So a person can learn Torah all day and commit murder at night. What does that tell you? It tells you that they're learning the words and they're shaking back and forth. It's all very nice. But there's a disconnect between here and here. There's a disconnect. If they don't respect Torah, the Torah can't protect you. Now, the Evanor Ezer said something very interesting. This coming week in Parshat Akev, Moshe describes how he won up Har Sinai, the mountain. And what does he say? For 40 days and 40 nights, what didn't I do? Yeah. I didn't eat. And I didn't drink. That's what it says. I didn't eat, I didn't drink 40 days and 40 nights. The Evano Ezer, the Pirush or Chumash, he says, I've never heard of a miracle as great as that. Like it was the most magnificent miracle he ever heard. Of course, they asked the question, really? What about Kriyat Yamsu? Pretty impressive. Ten plagues? Pretty impressive. Forty years, water in the desert following you, and clouds all around you, and food coming from Shemayim? Pretty impressive. There were many miracles. What was so unusual about this miracle that he says, Wow, Moshe Rabbeinu, Ella. He was like, like wow, unbelievable. So there was a rough from Europe, Rav Kreisworth. I think he was the chief rabbi in, in Belgium, Amsterdam, Belgium, Rav Kreisworth. He passed away a few years ago. Very big Talmud He says, let's go back and think about a few things Moshe Rabbeinu did. In this week's Parsha, Moshe Rabbeinu david to Hashem, let me live. I want to go into Israel. Now why did he want to go into Israel? What was, what was the reason? Tell me the reason why he wanted to go to Israel. He wanted to go on a on the balcony and retire? Was that what he wanted to do? Why didn't Moshe Rabbeinu want to go to Israel? Because there were only mitzvahs you could do in Israel. He wanted to do the mitzvahs of Israel. Teruma, Maser, Maser, Oni, Leket, Shechah, Pei. There are a lot of mitzvahs that you could only do in Israel. He wanted to do it. Hashem says no. The Medrash says that Moshe Rabbeinu said to Hashem, please let me go one day. Let me live just one extra day, 24 hours long. Hashem said, no. The manager says, Moshe says, okay, maybe I can't go as a person. Let me go as an insect. Let me go as an animal. I'll go as a horse, as a donkey, as a mule. Let me just go, I mean, I can maybe uh, help a Jew carry his, his things over. I'll go, you know, but put me into a donkey. Hashem said no. No, no, no. He wanted one more day. He wanted one more hour. No, no, no. Now, there's a fascinating story. Listen to this story. In Raden, where the Chofetz Chaim lived, the Chofetz Chaim lived in a small community, Shtetl, a small city called Raden. The head of the yeshiva in Raden was Rav Naftoli Trump. Trump is spelled T-R-O-P-P-E. Now, totally Trump. He was the loved, everybody loved him. He was a big Talmud Chochom. And he, he got very sick. And eventually he died, and he's buried there. I was at the cemetery, I saw his grave. Eventually he died. When he was very, very sick, a bunch of students got together 
and they did something very unusual. They said, we're going to collect days, weeks, months from everybody to give to our Rosh Hashim. So they went over to the students and said, what would you give? Adam Arishon gave David and Melech how many years? Seventy. Seventy. So one student says, I give four weeks of my life. Hashem should take away, I should die four weeks earlier. Let it go to Rabbi Trump. Another student says two months. Another student says three weeks. Another student says five weeks. And they went around collecting from students, you know, months, days, weeks, hoping that they'll gather a few years. And the last Hashem, here, we all gave our years. Some people give money. We gave time. Give it to the Rosh Hashim. We should have another few years. The committee went to the Chafetz Chaim. Chafetz Chaim. How much will you give? towards this project. Chovetz Chaim thought for a moment. He says, I'll give you one minute. Just one minute? One minute. <laughs> Why so cheap? And everybody looked and said, Shocked. You know, Shocked. <laughs> now maybe one minute in the life of the Chovetz Chaim is like years to somebody else, the Chovetz Chaim. You know? he, was not a, he was not like you and me. He was the Chovetz Chaim. Israel. But the Chovetz Chaim explained that you don't know the value of one minute being in this world. One minute learning Torah is priceless. One minute doing a mitzvah. One minute not speaking Lashon Hara. You think, you know, you give weeks away. One minute is precious. Moshe Rabbeinu begged Hashem, give me one day, give me one hour. It's precious, he said, it's precious. So now, listen to what Rav Kreisworth said. It's going to shock you. Moshe Rabbeinu, okay, we, we've established, Moshe Rabbeinu would do anything to have one extra day in this world, right? Yes. We, yes. Nobody loved Hashem, mitzvahs, Torah, more than Moshe Rabbeinu. You can only do mitzvahs in this world. Can you do mitzvahs in Olam Haba? No. Hashem says to Moshe, I want you to give the Torah to the Jewish people. But I'm going to ask you a big sacrifice. You have to come up to Shemayim for 40 days. You know what that means? 40 days, no talis, no tefillin, no brachos, no benching. 40 days, Moshe Rabbeinu did not do a mitzvah. Now, I'll make it even more exciting. How many times did he go up there? Three times. Three times. So it's 120 days. Wow. <laughs> So the Evan Ezra says, whoa, Moshe, who fasted and davened for one extra day, gave up 120 days of mitzvot just to bring the Torah to the Jewish people. He says, nobody loved the Jewish people like Moshe Rabbi. Because he gave up 120 days of doing mitzvot for Moshe, for, for Am Yisrael. That's love, he says. Nobody loved the Jewish people like Moshe Rabbeinu. That's unbelievable. And that is unbelievable that Rav Kreisworth brings that down. That it's he unbelievable. He wasn't able to learn the Torah, to write the Torah, right? He learned the Torah, right? This is like the cow only. No? Correct, except except when you're in Shemaim, when you're in heaven, there's no mitzvahs. Because when he was in Shemaim, he was a maloch, he was like an angel, he didn't eat. And malochim don't do mitzvahs. And malochim don't grow. And malochim don't get reward. Malochim are robots. So Moshe became an ish elokim, he became a maloch. It was wonderful, but no mitzvahs. They bring down a story and that in Yerushalayim there was a, a tremendous, tremendous posek in, in Godel Rav Baharan. Now, he, he must have been a Bukhari, he must have been Sephardi because there's a street in Shikun, I think, Bukharia in Jerusalem, in Yerushalayim. In Shukhan Bukhari, there's a street there, Rechov Baharan. And this man learned day and night. So the story goes that his granddaughter, 
Yeah, it's, it's a street called Rechol I, I Baharan. I was in the Yeah, it's, 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 it's yeah. So he, he used to learn day and night. So they, they bring down a story that his granddaughter, I think his daughter or his granddaughter, once came to the Beit Knesset, the Beit Medrash, and he was learning in his Gemara like this, and she put down a plate of cookies and a glass of milk and a little bottle of kerosene for his lamp. He didn't have electricity, he had a lamp. And he's learning over there. About an hour later, she comes to take the plates away, and she says, Abba, you ate the cookies, how come you didn't drink the milk? And he says, I drank the milk. <laughs> he drank the kerosene. Because wow. he, he didn't look at it. He didn't even notice it. He drank. He didn't even. He didn't notice it. He was so. So he so says, inside what? The Torah, yeah. He says what? <laughs> oh no! He says I made a bracha levatola. What? Because he made a shahakol on the kerosene, <laughs> but there's no bracha shahakol on kerosene. So he didn't say, "Oi, they! I drank I kerosene. Care, my, my, what's going to happen to my insides? What's going to happen to my that?" That he didn't care about. He All he cared about was, "Oi, they! I made a bracha levatol." <laughs> He wow. says, when you think about it, when you think about it, he survived. That, 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 he survived. He survived. <laughs> now, the greatness of Torah. There was a, there was a question that Rav Zilberstein was once asked. Someone once asked Rav Zilberstein that there was a, a young man, let's say a teenager, a 19-year-old kid, that committed a crime in Israel. He committed a crime, and. He was going to go to jail. They were going to send him to jail for six months, mm -hmm. but the court made it made, was give, was making a plea deal with him. They make deals. You can go to jail for six months, and then you go free, or you can do community service. What does that mean? We're going to send you to a kibbutz, not a religious kibbutz, a chiloni kibbutz, for one year, and you'll work. And then you'll, that's, that's how you, that's your debt. So you have two choices. Six months in jail, and you're free. Or one year in the kibbutz, you're not in jail, you're in the kibbutz, but the uh, community service. What? Right? What should you do? So they went to Rav Zilberstein, what should you do? Rav Zilberstein says he should sit in jail for six months. Why? Because... So everybody easy. said to Rav Zilberstein, exactly. Why? Shocking answer. He says, in jail, he knows that the other people in jail are not good people. He won't learn from their mistakes. But if you send him to a kibbutz that doesn't keep Shabbat, they don't, they're chiloni, he'll say, look, nice people, good people, they love the country, they work hard. In, in a year, you know what he's going to be? Good. He's going to be just like them. He's not going to keep Shabbat. Now. Influence him. They're going to influence him. He yeah. says, at least in jail, he so knows they're bad people. They're in jail. I'm not going to learn from them. He'll stay religious. But if you put him on a kibbutz for 12 months, he'll be not religious anymore. Environment. Maybe it's, it's mean for human. Maybe always change. What it means is you have to surround yourself with good people. Maybe he make about two hours. You know, you're right. <laughs> That's a very nice attitude I like it I wish that was true mm -hmm. but you know what happens in most cases most cases people become less religious it's very hard for people to become be, more religious. Be yeah it, it doesn't work that way it would be nice if it did boy that would be a punishment for everybody on the kibbutz quarter <laughs> <laughs> the people who is a belief from heart I think so. Never go to the judge and never open any case. You know what? People who have a strong foundation, maybe you're right. But every day we see people who have very strong foundations from very good families who are out on the street. We call them teenagers, kids at risk. And it's, it's scary. Because they come from wonderful, wonderful families, mm. very religious families, yeah. and somehow something happens.
get this gonna be. Yeah, killed still. Uh, there's a story of a, of a, I think, you know, they bring out a kid from Moscow, uh, an Ashkenazi Jew, who was in a yeshiva, but he wasn't learning very well. That means he was there in the yeshiva, but he really wasn't producing. So finally, the head of the yeshiva said to him, you know, I don't know why you're here. Maybe you should leave, go to college, you know, you're not doing anything here. You sit in the base bed and you sleep half the time. You're not, you're not producing. And he starts crying, no, 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 please don't send me away, don't send me away, don't send me away. So the head of the yeshiva said, why? When you're here, you're not interested. So, because you don't have a place to live, I'll find you a place to live. You know, why, why? So he said, years ago, he was in a bar, and he got mixed up with the wrong crowd, and he got arrested. And he spent six months in jail. And he said to himself, I take a, an oath, a shavua, that I'm only going to hang out in good places. He says, you're right. I don't come to the yeshiva because I want to learn. I come to the yeshiva because I know here is a good place. In life. And it will protect me from the bad people, from bad influences. Mm -hmm. So he says, I understand. If you want people who are going to learn, yeah. I'm not your guy. But I'm not a bad guy. But if you send me out, I could become, I don't know what. I, I want to be in this room because I surround myself by good people. Good environment. Good environment. You know, in the yeshiva, we always want people to produce. When a guy is a bum, he's not learning. I remember in Baltimore, in Neri Yisrael, and what I, did the did he agree with I think he agreed in the end. I remember in Neri Israel, uh, when I went to the high school there, the, the, the principal, the Menahel, the principal, was Rabbi Tendler. Rabbi oh. Tendler was from Lakewood Yeshiva. He came to Baltimore. His job was to clean up the place. You know, Neri Israel was in growing pains, and they had to clean up. And every year, if the high school had 150 kids, 75 were thrown out, they didn't come back. Every year. I mean, it's unbelievable. They brought in kids, and those who, who did well stayed. And those who didn't, they said goodbye to. They were trying to build the yeshiva up. I remember there was a kid from Memphis who somehow, a 10th grader, he was how much, 15 years old, he got into smoking cigarettes. And he stayed in the dorm, and he was smoking cigarettes. And we all thought for sure they were going to throw him out. They're not going to keep a guy like that. Now, maybe his father had money, and maybe that made a difference, but I don't think so. In the end, they kept him, at least till the end of the year. And after that, he left. But they kept him. I never understood why they kept him. But they, later on, they explained to me, we kept him because had we sent him out, it would have been worse. That means, you're right, he wasn't for us. And he wasn't an example for us. But we believe that all you kids were strong enough not to learn from him. So he wasn't dangerous. But if we sent him home, where would he have gone to public school? So instead of cigarettes, he would have gotten into worse. So we kept him just to keep him safe. I understood it. When I was 13 or 14 years old, I didn't understand it. When I was older, I understood it. He brings down a story here, an interesting story. He says, at the foot of the Rocky Mountains, it's a story by a Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick. He wrote a book by Dale Carnegie, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. He says, at the foot of the Rocky Mountains are trees that are 400 years old. Now, you have to understand what that means. These trees were before Columbus came to America. These trees, he says, there was a particular tree was struck by lightning 14 times mm. and still standing. Mm. There were avalanches in the mountains, in the Rocky Mountains, in Colorado, snow comes on avalanches, just wipes everything off. Numerous storms and avalanches over four centuries. The tree still stood. <laughs> One day, the tree fell. Wow. When they looked to see what brought this big, strong, mighty tree down, they found little beetles had eaten the inside of the tree until it no longer could stand in the top. So he said, 
we were so worried about lightning and thunder and storms and snow and avalanches. And you know what finally brought this enormous tree down? A little bug that you could squash in your hand like that. Destroyed the tree. So he says, we all fight the big fights. But we don't realize that sometimes the, the fight that brings us down are the little fights. It's not always the big fights that tear down a community or tear down a person. Sometimes it's the little fight. It's the little things, he says. You know, the Gemara brings down stories, bar kamsa, bar kamsa, a rooster and a hen, uh, different things that the Beit Hamidus were destroying. These were little things. Bar kamsa, kamsa was, a, was a party. Would you destroy a whole city over a party? Sounds silly. But the Gemara seems to say that the little things, it's the little things that often destroy things. There's a Pesach at the hill. Evan Mo'asu Haboni, the stones that the builders threw away, Hoysel Rosh Pina, they became the most important stones of the Beit HaMikdash. So the Belzer Rebbe gave a very interesting thing. He says, that you've been to the Western Wall, to the Kotel? Describe the stones that make up the Western Wall. Describe the stones. Tell me the stones that are in the Kotel. What stones? How big? This is uh, huge. big. It's huge. Enormous. Yeah, the, enormous. The, the, one, right. one, one thousand kilograms each, maybe. Yeah, yeah, enormous stones. Tons. So he tons. says, the Belzer Rebbe says as follows. He says, when they were building the Beit HaMikdash, they brought these big stones. How did they bring it? I don't know how they brought it. They, they, have, a, they have a video. If you go to the uh, tunnels underneath, they show the, how they brought it on the wood, and then they rolled it, you know, pretty crazy stuff how they did it. Uh, but they did it, somehow they did it. He says, if you were like chis chiseling the stone, right? And so the big stone you kept, but as you chiseled it to prepare it, the little stones, what'd you do with the little stones? <coughs> you threw it away, you didn't want it. Even more asu haboni, the little stones that they threw away, once they finish the building, bless you, they finish the building. But when you put these big stones one on top of the other, you had little holes everywhere. Little because nothing fits. So what do you what do you use to fill up the little holes? The little rocks. The little rocks. So he says when they were finished, but it wasn't complete yet. They had to fill in the holes in the ground, they had to fill in the cracks and everything else. Now, the stones that they threw away before. They became the most important thing. They were bringing these little stones, wagon after wagon, filling it in. He says, in life, sometimes we only look at the big stuff. But at the end of the day, what do you need? Small the small rocks, he says. That's what the belt of says. Come. Heaven mo'asu haboni. Even the small rocks. Hoysa la rosh pino. They became very, very important. He brings out a story here. Listen to this story. Reb Nissen Shulman. I know Reb Nissen Shulman. He, he brings out a story. He says there was a rabbi who was invited as a guest to Buckingham Palace. Where's Buckingham Palace? Buckingham, Germany. No. Buckingham? Buckingham Palace is in England. Not the Queen. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, the King Gems, oh, the King Gems, the Cardinal. He was invited as a guest to Buckingham Palace. Yeah. A particular rabbi. Oh. I don't know which one it was. Maybe it was Lord Jacobowitz. You know, one of the chief rabbis. The Cardinal, Red Head. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was a rabbi. He was an Orthodox rabbi. So now, at Buckingham Palace, they sat you at tables. They had 12 tables, 12 enormous tables. So he sat at the table. They hired for him a mashkiach. And the mashkiach came over to the rabbi and he says, I want you to know that even though your plate and your silverware looks like everybody else's, if you turn it over, I put a little piece of paper on it. It's brand new. It was never used. So don't worry. The food is kosher. And your plate and the silverware is all brand new. never was used. Okay. In Buckingham Palace, 
they have a 12 course meal. That means there's 12 courses. And what they do is, after you finish the first course, there's a bell that rings, a dong, dong. And then you get up and you move, everybody moves to a different table, you have a chart. This way, all the guests sit with everybody else. So you move from table one, next to your table five, next to your table seven, next to your table nine. No discrimination. No discrimination. So you move around, so you meet everybody. The dog rings, and everybody starts getting up. So yes, the state of the rabbi, you know, you have to get up. You're going to, look, look at your card, you're going to table five. So he takes his dishes, right? <laughs> he picks up his plate, he picks up his silverware and his glass. <laughs> So they say to him, Rabbi, you don't have to take your dishes. There's fresh dishes over there. By the time you get there, they'll have a brand new set of dishes for everybody. He says, I know, but these are kosher dishes. I, 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 he has a so he walks around with his dishes. <laughs> Prince Philip sees this. And he calls him over and he says, Rabbi, you don't have to carry your dishes. You'll get new dishes. He says, yeah, but these dishes are kosher dishes. They were never used before. He says, really? I know we hired someone to supervise. So uh, the food is kosher. I never knew you had to have kosher dishes. <coughs> so he says, yes, because the dishes absorb from non-kosher. You put kosher. And he's talking to Prince Philip for 10 minutes. And Prince Philip is really interested. He's really interested. <laughs> So another Jewish guest comes over to, to Prince Philip, you know, to, the rabbi standing there, and he says to Prince Philip, I see how much attention he gave me the rabbi, I want you to know I'm also Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thinking that Prince Philip will give him, so Prince Philip says, you're Jewish? Where are your dishes? <laughs> Where are your dishes? I just learned that a Jew does not eat on the carry. So if you're not carrying your dishes, what kind of a Jew are you? <laughs> this fun is here. That, that's what he brings down over here. The prince says, I didn't notice you're carrying your dishes. Where are your dishes? He says, you know, sometimes we Jews are so embarrassed about being Jewish, right? And he says, you don't realize, he says, the Goyim respect you. That's what it says in Vos Hanum. It says in Vos Hanum, okay, uh, do what I tell you. This is what makes you so smart and understanding in the eyes of the nations. When they hear all the things you do, what are they going to say? Look how smart the Jews are. Look, again, we're not talking about anti Semitism. We're talking about people saying, wow, look how they, 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 how they respect their rules. You know, because. If you don't respect the rules, I mean, you come, for example, you, 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 there's a test on Shabbos. So a Jew comes and gives the professor a letter that says, you know, you know I cannot take any test on Shabbos. That's good. But if the professor says to you, how come all the other Jewish kids in the class are taking the test on Shabbos? Mm. You're stuck. You're stuck, right? What are you supposed to say? I'm Orthodox? I believe in the Torah? It's like in Lebrak and Shabbos. It's like Security, African challenge. Security says, well, you say, you cannot get it. He says, yeah, but look at all your the people other Jews. Sprint, yeah, past, just past the open. And, 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 and it hurts. It hurts because they're, they're not the ones you want to judge Judaism by. You're the one they want to judge Judaism by. It hurts. That's exactly, that's a perfect example. Okay, it's almost time to go. Question over here. A guy gives a suit to the cleaners. Comes a week later to pick up the suit. And the cleaners can't find it. They lost the suit. Okay. They have insurance, so they pay you $75 for your suit. Okay. Two days later, the cleaners call you up and say, Good news! We found your suit. <laughs> now, what the guy wants to say is, That was an old suit. Keep it. I got my $75. <laughs> Okay, but assuming, that, let's say the cleaner is Jewish, what's the halacha? They paid you because they lost the suit. But they found it, Hashavah Avedo. And now they say, give us back our $75, and Thank we'll give you back your suit. Yeah. You have to give him back the money and take the suit back. So the halacha is yes. Yes, we must do that. You must do that. 
Again, maybe as an example of Sisa uh, Hayashar Vatov, sometimes you have to do the right thing. The right thing is, you can at least wear the suit. It's your suit. He paid you out by mistake because he thought the suit was lost. It wasn't lost. It was misplaced. He cannot use your suit. So what's he going to do? So the right thing is to give back the money. But halacha is very interesting. If I took the money and I bought myself another suit already, that's it. That's it. Then you're asking me to take money out of my own pocket because I replaced the suit. Then it's different. Okay, interesting, right? Yes. Like his mind, his but he must do you turn That's a right. new suit for them? No. No, I, I took the money you gave me. I bought myself a new suit. Now you want what? The money back? I don't have the money. I already spent it. How much for the suit in the cleaners before Rosh Hashanah? Right. And then within two days, the whole place burned down. <laughs> and then everything, I got, I got nothing. You didn't even get money? Nothing? No insurance? The place was just gone was gone. They have stories like that. There was a story on a show once and the guy came with an old suit. He said, what happened to your suit? He said, I just sent all my suits to the cleaners and the, and the, and the cleaners burnt down. In four days. So they said, you sent, he had four suits. He sent all four to the cleaners at the same time? He said, yeah. I don't have time to go to the cleaners. I sent all four. He lost all four suits. <laughs> In other point, if you the for people gives uh, shock them and tell them I lost your suit, and you seek after that, and I tell listen, now you I buy new suit, and I don't need the old suit, something like that. Is I'm uh, idea is if you seek the judge, what to give the answer? I don't know because the judge has to believe, and maybe the jury has to believe that losing your suit could make you emotionally not well. Not well. So you have to file a civil suit, and good luck. Mm -hmm. I suspect the judge is going to dismiss the suit. Mm -hmm. I remember, I won't uh, keep it another minute, and just, I don't want to say the name. I, I, when I spoke yesterday, I did say the name. I shouldn't, but I asked him, I felt bad saying who would happen. There was a, a very respected family who invited a guest for Shabbat to their house. And the guy was about 32, 33 years old. He wasn't married. And they invited him for Shabbat. And the wife of this guy has connections with some of the schools, the Jewish schools, the girls' schools. So the guy said, you know, you seem like a very nice guy. You know, I'm going to try to read you a shidda. I'm going to try to, you know, read you a shidda. Comes to Motsoi Shabbat Sunday, and he starts hearing that this guy that was at his house is not all there. He has some issues, mental issues, or whatever it is. So he never recommends a shidduch. Guy calls up once or twice. Remember, I was at your guest. He said, Yeah, you said you were going to recommend me a shidduch, some girls. And the guy says, Yeah, I, I just haven't thought of anyone right now. The guy went to court and filed a Ten million dollar lawsuit against this family. You promised that you would read me shiduchim. You didn't do it. Emotional distress. And what's the end? Well, they went to court, uh -huh. and the family had to hire a lawyer, and the judge threw this out in thirty seconds. Within thirty seconds, the judge said, "Are you crazy? Just because you're a guest at someone's house, and they say you seem like a nice guy, uh, maybe I can." If I can think of someone, I'll make you a shidduch, and he doesn't come up with a, a suggestion for a date, you sue the guy for $30 million, $10 million. But it just goes to show that anybody can sue. Oh. But suing and winning are two separate things, but this couple still have to spend a few thousand dollars to hire a lawyer. Oh, yeah. wow. So for that Shabbat table, for that, it was a, it was a nightmare. A couple of them. It was a nightmare. Ashkenazi or <laughs> <laughs> no, I would Bukharian. love to say Bukharian. that it was Ashkenazi. <laughs> you know, some people, we say in English there's a word litigious. Litigious means they like to sue. No matter what happens, sue, sue, and sue. But there's a big spread between suing someone and winning. Anybody can sue. And you're, it's called a nuisance suit. 
but you go to the court and you ask for summary judgment. You say that the case has no merit. And I want the judge, I want to, your honor, to hear the case briefly to see if it has any merit. If the judge says it has merit, then we have to go to trial. But if the judge says, you're right, it has no merit, the judge has the power to throw the case out. Just like that, throw it out. But it's still aggravating, and it's still a process. And you know, you, you I don't even, I don't know how often any of you have ever been to courts. So you should go once in a while. You should go to Supreme Court and just sit and watch. No, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be in court, and you don't want to be in Supreme Court, and you don't want to be on the witness stand. I've been on the witness stand many times. You don't want to be there, even as, as experienced as I might be, as knowledgeable as I am of the law. You just don't want to be in court. If you've ever been in court, it's not pleasant. Anybody can see. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you so much.